by Dr. Ashwini Parekh. So Dr. Ashwini Parekh is a prominent plant biologist and educator noted chiefly for his contribution in plant molecular biology and biotechnology. He is currently working as professor of plant molecular biology and biotechnology at the School of Life Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and adjunct professor at the University of Western Australia. He has interest in understanding the physiological and molecular adaptations in zero halophytic plants and development of transgenic rice plants with enhanced tolerance towards multiple abiotic stresses. He is the recipient of several honors, including the Visitors Award for Technology Development from the President of India for developing stress tolerant rice of the next generation, abbreviated as STRONG that has the potential to enhance the income of rice farmers. Recently, he was awarded Tata Innovation Award 2020 by the Department of Biotechnology Government of India. He was elected Fellow of the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences, New Delhi in 2016 and the National Academy of Sciences, India in 2013. He received the INSA Royal Society London Award for Exchange Visitors Fellowship to work at the University of Cambridge, UK, and the Rockefeller Foundation Award for the Postdoctoral Fellowship at the University of North Carolina, USA. Dr. Parik has authored and published more than 150 research papers and articles in research journals. Some of these journals include Nature, Journal of Experimental Botany, Plant Physiology, The Plant Journal, plant, cell, and environment, etc. He has edited or co-edited three books, Abiotic Stress Adaptation in Plants, Physiological, Molecular, and Genomic Foundation. Another one is Biotechnology in Medicine and Agriculture, Principles and Practices, and Pre-Field Screening Protocols for Heat-Tolerant Mutants in Rice. Dr. Parikh has many patents in the field of plant genetic engineering, and we are deeply honored to have him on our platform today. Uh, we are now moving on to our interview session. Uh, today was our webinar number 23 on towards uh, raising crops for saline and drylands by Dr. Ashwani Parikh. We are truly fortunate that we got to learn so much from him. Dr. Parikh has a lot of research and training experience both in India and abroad. And I'm sure we all want to know more about him. Uh, sir, uh, you are a very successful plant scientist and we would love to know how you built your career. Uh, could you please tell us about your journey so far? Okay, thank you very much, Soma. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, contribute through my small efforts in this area. Salinity and drought field are much more complex. They require input from each one of us uh, listening to a conversation in case we need to ensure that enough food is available uh, when salinity and drought are increasing in many countries, including India. But since you have asked the question, uh, very humbly, I would like to say that uh, there is a YouTube video which has been made by Cornell University of Al uh, Cornell Alliance for Science, mm -hmm. Cornell University Alliance for Science. If you just uh, uh, Google it with my name, YouTube, uh, and the name of the video is Pursuing a Dream. I would suggest that uh, uh, the audience should uh, view that, watch that uh, video, because this pertains to the real issue of salinity and drought and why I got interested. I belong to a small village in Rajasthan, uh, which is known as Sambar Lake. My father was a farmer. And interestingly, this is the largest salt water lake in Asia, which is natural. And it is believed then when the Gondwana land were moving, on one hand, we have the Himalaya erupting. And mm -hmm. on the left side in Rajasthan, some of the sea water got entrapped and that is being maintained. Mm -hmm. So this Sambhar Lake uh, is next to Jaipur within 100 kilometers. It's a huge lake, beautiful lake, I would say, where thousands of uh, you know, migratory birds, they come and do it. But what is important is that the salt is being produced from this lake commercially since hundreds and hundreds of years. Meaning that by that, there is enough salinity available in this area. And people have been minting money by extracting those that salt from the water and selling it off. I think the salt from this lake is being utilized for consumption throughout the country. Name of the village is Sambar Lake. So my father was a farmer. Uh, one fine morning when I was doing my graduation, he called me. Uh, at that time, we did not have a telephone at our home but he was in my hometown and I was in Delhi during my graduation. He called me up that 
the the tube well which we were using for irrigation in our field which mm -hmm. is next to this sea sea uh, lake salt lake the water of that tube well got suddenly saline okay so our farm is next to the uh, lake shore so which mm -hmm. basically mean that the the well and the lake somehow got connected below the ground and the water from lake started dripping in and my when, when my father turned on that tube well he actually used the water from the lake and many such farmers in that area started complaining about it because you know we are extracting more water from a neighboring area so the water table from that uh, lake will certainly suddenly uh, certainly start moving sweeping into the neighboring villages meaning thereby that uh, the the salinity level in that area is increasing naturally it's not the spread of the lake per se but the spread of the lake water which is turning the agricultural land into saline land. and productivity productivity is going down my father could grow uh, wheat and uh, panicetum over there but then we could not grow then we shifted to horticulture because some of the flower they can uh, they can tolerate high salinity that stopped over a period of time now we only grow the plants such as zero helophyte such as agave you know guarpata which we call in hindi which is highly tolerant to salinity in doubt but many farmers are are forced to actually leave that village and this video which i just shared with you uh, pursuing a dream summarizes the problem of the farmers and conversation with the farmer are they open to the technology that the government is going to be and i'm very happy to say that farmer is in india and many of the places all over all over the world are most intelligent person i would say uh, you know when it comes to farmer because you know his livelihood is associated with the farming technology and tools mm -hmm. the new tools and technology he is using isn't it Yes. So if he invests a rupee in the farming, he would expect that rupee should give at least two rupees back so that he can use it for the family. Mm -hmm. So farmer is very open to new technology, and I'm very happy to say when you talk to them, they're very open in uh, you know using the technology such as transgenic equipment. But that is the time which I just shared with you that I thought that I would uh, uh, I would address this problem, and I did my uh, graduation project in salinity, my master's project in salinity, my PhD in salinity. all postdocs in salinity the salinity 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 throughout years and now we have the product which we have been able to patent and commercialize so i'm very happy to share the journey from my graduation till now uh, thank you very Beautiful. much for asking this question what a journey <laughs> uh, sir uh, you have received many fellowships and awards uh, what is the driving force for your dynamic nature uh driving force has been a willingness to work because i personally believe that uh, to be positive i think uh, you have to be productive so i keep on telling my student that productivity always brings in the positivity in especially in this area this message for all of you who are listening to me we are undergoing a, a century level a pandemic and most of us are feeling that uh, different kind of feelings are coming in our mind but my suggestion to all of you is that those who are listening to me especially the student community keep yourself busy be productive if you are a research student who are sitting at home are not able to do research they should keep on analyzing their data they should start reading literature develop their understanding because they should use it as an opportunity or write reviews because once you are productive automatically the positivity comes in and in my lab i am very fortunate that uh, whosoever student i got they were very hard working very honest they work day and night so we work as a family in my laboratory we share all birthdays uh, the student come and share with me we share dinner table we go out i think this is a kind of family relationship which has given high productivity from our lab and when it comes to productivity sooner or later people are going to realize it people are going to appreciate it people are going to recognize this in the form of awards so that has been perhaps the driving force for many of us primarily the students are responsible for it and i am only representing them here sir uh, you are also an adjunct professor at the university of western australia uh, is the method of teaching or instruction there different from that of india and how is your teaching experience there right that's a good question i think we need to understand that when it comes to knowledge i think we are not different from any other country because all nowadays all the uh, teaching tools are available uh, uh, at international level when it comes to books we are sharing the books which are being shared by the student uh, in australia and many other countries but there is one uh, basic difference between our teaching and their teaching number one uh, they uh, they are teaching in large groups well like a professor teaches in the large group like uh, if i have taken several classes over there 
when I go there, all my slides are ready and they are teaching assistance available and mm -hmm. all the projection are being done. I give my thought and the, uh, the teaching assistant, they help me in preparing those slides and making the teaching material. But what is most important than that, the feedback which we take from student in terms of mm -hmm. tutorial, where group of student, they are assigned to one teaching assistant, group of another student are assigned to another. So group of five to 10 students are assigned to one teaching assistant, okay. which will start working after my lecture and they will start extracting questions from the student and they try to, you know, give them confidence in that particular topic. And they kind of, you know, uh, make them understand the topic if some of the students are not able to understand the lecture or one particular topic in the lecture the job of this ce is would be to discuss with them to encourage them to ask questions and clear their doubt and if it is not clear they always tell me that this particular student is not able to understand then i go and uh, you know uh, help that particular student so uh, taking student at an individual level and looking at their interest and problem at individual level is something which is paying uh, in teaching and i'm very glad that i use that for my own teaching as well uh, though university has not uh, make it mandatory to get a feedback but uh, every student in my class after every semester give me a written feedback which is anonymous and i tell them don't write positive things write negative things only and they go example there is no form i provide they can write as, as what they want and that actually helps me in understanding their nature so i take a feedback during middle of the semester and at the end of the semester. And then middle semester gives me enough confidence that I have to focus on specific student for this particular topic, for this particular reason. And then I, I take care of that. So teaching in Western University is different. Uh, and I have learned a lot from that experience. It's absolutely wonderful. Feedback is definitely very important. Uh, sir, uh, according to you, which sectors of plant science uh, will prosper in the near future? I think uh, plant science, we need to understand that, uh, of course, basic science is important. Now the funding agencies, especially in India and many other countries, and that is very true in the situation where the pandemic is growing and a lot of funding agencies are running financial crisis. The work which can lead to development of a product ultimately, sooner mm -hmm. or later, that kind of work will be uh, supported in years to come uh, in plant sciences. Uh, let's talk about, say, the topic which we discussed, developing plants which are much more resilient to climate change or which are nutritionally very high or high yield. I think these kind of research, uh, the ultimate goal should be development of a transformation product. Those kind of research will be supported and they will go high. And the usage of technologies such as the, the genome editing technologies, which are not only important from product development, but from basic science point of view, understanding how different genes are regulated and what happens when you mutate this particular gene. So these kind of uh, research, I think, uh, should be supported and will be supported no matter how much financial crisis are there at the funding and funding level. Right. Uh, sir, uh, if you would uh, conclude uh, this session uh, with a few words of advice from you to the younger uh, novice uh, research fellows out there. Mm, that's very important. I think uh, when you say younger, uh, uh, it's very important. I start feeling old. So, yeah. No, it's a novice. <laughs> good, good, good. No, I think uh, the younger generation is uh, much more full of ideas. They are much more energetic. They are much more open to new technologies. They are uh, very sharp. They can do multitasking. My daughter can do several things on laptop and computer and a lot of things she can do. She can make a cup of tea for me while she is on mobile. So I think the new generation is much more... Uh, uh, comfortable in handling multiple tasks. But one message I would like to give, which I think is very important, even if you are intelligent, uh, intelligence cannot replace the hard work, right? right. So one of That's my students was there, I will not name him. This is, uh, he was very intelligent, but he will come only, you know, in the afternoon and he will come only on alternate days. Even if you are intelligent, you can grasp very well, you can do very efficient experiment. But ultimately, hard work is important. Intelligence cannot replace hard work. And I think uh, I would like to recite one of the shlokas uh, over here, which is from Sanskrit, which says that Nahi pravishanti mukhe mraga. So that actually means that even if the loin is there, uh, the deer will not go and enter the mouth of the loin. The loin actually has to earn his food by working hard. Loin is, you know, full of power, the magnanimity of line is known to us. And deer is quite uh, simple. So even if 
uh, the deer is there the lion has to go and hunt for it then only he can feed mm-hmm. himself so i think that's the message i would like to give uh, beautiful do beautiful not, message uh, do not uh, stop doing hard work even if you are intelligent that's the message um it was so wonderful to hear you uh, speak and uh, you. such clarity such clarity i mean the presentation was actually beautiful i mean i forgot everything else i'm just watching <laughs> Very nice of you to say that. If I could, thank, um, you. thank you so much sir